Okay, so let's get started. So today's uh, lesson is we're going to build this um, fractal machine. It's the best way to think of it. And what this is basically what it does is it's going to be like a little mini, think of it almost like a, a little virtual computer processor, um, like a CPU. It's going to take in a set of instructions, and instead of those instructions uh, manifesting to mathematical operations and 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 these kind of low-level things that a, a, your computer processor does. In our case, it's going to these instructions are going to directly correlate to various transforms in the 3D space, and by basically by feeding in these different instructions and by altering these parameters, in a very compact way, we can define a, a system that we can kind of then recurse on and build all sorts of interesting structures. So this is kind of an example of, of this uh, script right here and what it kind of manifests, and it just simply does that just by a few simple rules. And uh, you'll notice, that, for instance, these, this R rule here is repeat. So that will repeat this. And then MX, in this case, is to move an item. But we'll break it down. We'll start from scratch. And then we'll see how to what each command does and, and how we build up to this. So I'm going to go File New. And the first thing we're going to do, we're going to work in this kind of open space here. I think it's a good place to, to kind of build this example out of. The first thing we're going to do is just create our, our, a box. This is just going to represent our kind of our primitive that will be manipulated uh, in our in our little uh, machine in our fractal processor and I'm gonna just I'm gonna um, for simplicity's sake I'm gonna set this thing's shape to be nice and even one by one by one in this way um, our units will all kind of line up and, and you'll see why we're gonna do this in a second um, so make sure you set everything to one to begin with and the next thing we're gonna want to do is we're gonna create a global script and this script is going to live inside our terrain space. And this is going to basically be all of the script that's going to kind of perform our fractal generation. So we'll be able to access this from any other object. And we'll be able to call a single function that will then take in a string and create a manifestation uh, of, that, of that string uh, on, on the object that we pass in. So I'm just going to right click in here, create a new script. And I'm going to create a new global script. And I'm going to call, call this global script our fractal processor essentially going to be where all of our fractal logic will occur in. I'm going to then double click on this and by default anytime we create a global script it creates this kind of default script. We're just going to delete this. So now what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to implement um, the on init function in here. Um, so I'm going to click on the fractal processor and call and click on this on init event. You could also just type this in directly. This is the, this is the code that gets called as soon as play is pressed. And it's inside here that we're going to kind of trigger our fractal to be created. And so before we actually start building that, that machine processing function, let's just um, kind of start with how we're going to call this function. So the first thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to take in our box entity. That's going to be our, our the thing that we're going to operate on. I'm just going to drag and drop this from the hierarchy into here. And then we're going to basically going to be calling a function that's going to perform our fractaling. Um, and we're going to call this function run. So basically what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be calling a function on myself called run. It's going to take in our box entity, in this case our box, and it's going to take in a script. And this is what we're going to come up with today. The first command that we're going to implement is going to be a movement command. That's going to be, that's really going to say, take this box and move it. Move it by some unit. And um, so the, what I keep, a, a straightforward way is just going to be the letter M. M represents move. And now any move operation is going to need an axis, right? It's going to need, uh, where do we want to move up? Up? Or do we want to move straight? Do we want to move back? Do we want to move left? Do we want to move right? Do we want to be up or down? So for that, we're going to have to either define x, y, or z. And so the second uh, operand of our script is going to be x in this case, because we're going to want to move it along the x-axis. And Or we can make that y, but we'll, we'll, we'll do that. We'll, we'll flesh out all those different details. And then we're going to need a direction. So plus or minus will tell us if we should go in the positive x direction. Minus will be in the minus uh, x direction. So we'll start with plus and then a number. And so in this case, one, two, three, or four, whatever, all, all the way up to nine. We're going to stick with single digits because it keeps our script to be uh, as nice and compact. If you wanted to have it move uh, ten units, for instance, you could just do another command. But we'll we'll get it. We'll show you how to what the, how to do that in a second. Okay. So now we've defined a simple little operation that is um, uses essentially just a, a, a f just four characters. With these four characters, it's going to tell our system, in this case, to move along the x-axis one unit in the positive direction. So it's going to do this. 
And if we did this, if we made this minus, it's, it would move it in this direction. So that's how we're going to start. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to implement this move operation. Okay, so now we're going to implement our um, our run function. And so this is what we're calling here. Basically, self colon run is going to be calling this function here, and it takes in our object. In this case, the, the box entity that we're going to and that we're going to be operating uh, our script on, and it's going to take in our code. That's this this value here. So now we just have to write a, a little uh, loop, an iteration that's going to step into this this string here one by one, and look at each character and depending on what it finds performs the operation that it sees. In this case the first thing it's going to see is a move is m for move so it's going to know to interpret the next three values as the axis and direction that it's going to move it along. And then we're going to introduce others for instance we're going to introduce rotate. So it's going to be a rotate along the y-axis one unit. And then we're going to introduce even others uh, scale and adding impulses so what we need to do basically is just step into this string. And so how do we do that? So we're going to create a repeat loop. And we're going to repeat um, until we reach the end of our code. So code length. And what we're going to be doing is we're actually going to iterate using an i value. So I'm going to define a variable. i is equal to 1. That's going to represent the first character initially. And then we're going to increment it every time to step over each character. So and I'm going to repeat until this i goes goes past the length of our string. So once it once this i value goes past the length of our string, it will stop and it'll exit this loop. And then we got to make sure to increment i each each iteration. So so our little loop now will take in this this function will take in this code and it will literally just loop over each character here. So now we just need to kind of look at the characters and depending on what we see, perform an operation in our space based on what we see. So we're, in this case, the first, the first type of transform we define is M. So we're going to have to pull out of this code our M letter. And so how do we do that? We're just going to say code sub i comma i. And how did I know how to do that? Well, if we go to the Lua manual here, you'll see that the Lua, Lua manual, Lua has a function uh, string function called sub and you'll see this is what we're calling here it's this function right here string.sub and if we look at how it works it says it returns the substring of s in this case this would be our code that string um, that starts at i and continues until j so by setting both uh, the the two parameters i and i we're basically saying uh, start at i and go to i basically is what we're saying so literally just return one letter that's located at i and that's going to be, we're going to store that in C, in a variable called C. So in this case, it's going to, when we start with this code, it's going to return M, and then it's going to return X, and then it's going to return plus, and it's going to return 1. And so now we can say, okay, if C is equal to M, this is our move operation. So whenever we see an M, we know we're always going to require the next three characters to be in the form of X, Y, Z, plus, minus, and then a number from 1 to 9. So that we're going to basically consume the next three, whenever we see an M, we're going to consume the next three characters to be our arguments of that M, basically. And so we're basically just going to repeat this logic. But this time we're going to say I plus one, that's the next character up from I. And this is going to be our axis, right? It's going to be X, Y, or Z. The next character after that, I'm just going to copy this three times. The next character of that is going to be plus or minus. So that's, this is going to be i plus 2, right? Because we're going to take that i value, which is initially here, and this i plus 1 is going to be the x. i plus 2 is going to be the plus, and the i plus 3 is going to be the 1. And then so then i plus 3 is going to be our unit, how far we're going to be moving it. So we're going to now, in these three variables, we're going to have our x, y, or z, our plus, or minus, and our 1, two, one through 9 value. So we want to convert this now into a vector that we can then apply to our object in the space. And so to do this, we're going to write a little, a little utility function, because we're going to be using this, actually, we're going to be doing this for a bunch of other ones. For instance, when we scale and rotate, we're going to want the same, the same kind of, we're going to use the same exact paradigm. So I'm going to create a little function up here that's going to serve as our little utility function that's going to convert to a vector. So we're going to say two vector, and this is going to take in our three parameters. It's going to take in our axis. It's going to take in our direction, and it's going to take in our units. So here, down, down here, we're, we're literally just going to call that function. We're going to say vector is equal to two vector, 
passing in those three parameters that we pulled out of our string. And for a unit, we're going to actually want to convert that to a number because it's going to be a string. You know, this Because we're pulling it out of a string, this is actually going to be one as a string and, and we want to convert that into an actual, the number one. It'll make things easier. So we're going to convert that. Our, our, our two vector function is going to require this to be a number. So we can actually make that more clear, say a unit's number. Okay, so now we just have to take in the x, y, or z, and this plus and this number, and convert this to a vector 3, which we can then apply to our object in this space. So to do this, we're just going to define a vector is equal to vector 3, and we're just going to initialize this to 0, 0, 0. And now a vector 3, what this returns is essentially a table, right? It's going to return a table whose that has three elements in it, x, y, and z. And so we can use that access basically that we pass into here as an index into our table. So we say v access, it literally will point to x, y, or z inside our vector 3. And we're going to set this equal to our units number. So that's going to return now a vector. We're going to basically mutate or set the x, y, or z equal to our number that we pass in. So we're going to either get you know, whatever our unit here will be, it'll return a vector. This will be now a vector 3 that has that unit's number in either the x, y, or z component of this vector. And the last thing we want to do is look at the direction. And we know that this is either going to be plus or minus. And if it's basically, if it's equal, equal to the minus, then we want to invert our vector. And then so that v is equal to v times negative 1. And then we're going to return our v, our vector. So now this converts this x, uh, this 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 form here into a uh, three-dimensional vector into this vector three. So once we have a vector three, we can apply it to our object. And so we're literally going to take our object and we're going to say set its world position. Now we want this to be relative. So we don't want to set an absolute world position. We want to make it. We want this to be a relative move. We want to say wherever it happens to be, shift it up by the vector that we've that we passed in. So then, so to do that, we're just going to say object get world position, and we're going to add in our vector. So wherever it happens to be located, we're going to take that location, the current location, and we're going to add in this. So this is a delta vector essentially we're passing in. So this is basically saying move our op object by one unit. And so if we, if we say mx plus one again, it's going to then move it again. Okay, so once it's done this, it's going to exit our, it's going to exit our loop and we'll repeat to the next next character. Now the problem is is that then i is going to point to x. So we, have, we just have to remember to also advance. Since we've already consumed three additional parameters, uh, uh, elements from our string here, we need to make sure we advance i by the, that count, which in this case is three. So in other words, when we get to the m, we then, in this if statement, kind of look at these next three characters. When we exit this loop to kind of have it um, i is equal to i plus three. When we have when we exit this, this if statement here and have the loop go to the next item, we want to make sure that it starts here at the end of this and not at the x here. So we need to like force i to kind of resume where we left off here. So we now fully have created a little a little mini processor here. So again, it's going to take, we're going to basically say on our box here, we want to run this script, this little code here, which we interpret it as move uh, along the x-axis by one unit in the positive direction. And, and that's how we, we achieve that. So let's see what happens when we hit play. There it goes. It moved, it took that object and it moved it one along the x-axis. So if we add this again, so it's ready to consume another command. So it's going to go i plus one and it's going to go and read the next command. So we can just say mx, maybe we want to move it up the y-axis. So my plus one. So it's going to move it one to the right and up one by one. And there it goes. And because uh, physics is turned on, it falls. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to pause um, the spaces timeline. So I'm going to click on the ground here. And I'm going to go to the timeline. I'm just going to set it to deactive. So that's going to pause physics. So now we're just going to see it hang in the air. So it's moved it to the right one, and it's moved it up by one. So that's kind of neat, but it's pretty limiting in that we we only have we can only operate on this original object. So what we really want is we want to introduce a duplication function. We want to uh, add a new command that will duplicate our box. So once it's duplicated, we can then start operating and applying new commands on the new duplication. And so then you can imagine this thing kind of building structures and, and all sorts of cool things if we can just duplicate it. So that's another fundamental element we're going to introduce. So we're going to literally make the letter D as a command interpret as duplicate the object. So back in our in our run function here, if we see an M, we, we do a move and we interpret those three next characters as a move. If we see a, whoops, 
if we see a D, so I'm going to do else if, if our character, uh, our current character that we're iterating over is equal to D, then we're, that's going to force us to do a copy of our object. So our object, obj, is just going to equal to obj um, clone as a copy. And so that'll make a copy of it. So every single time it sees the letter D, it'll make a copy of wherever it happens to be. So I'm going to get rid of this Y. Let's just stick with moving it to the right one. Actually, what we'll do is we'll make a copy of it first. So we're going to take this Q, we'll make a copy of it. And then on that copy, we're going to move it over by one. And the reason why uh, we then operate on the copy is because clone as copy returns our copy. And then we overwrite this OBJ that we pass into here. We overwrite it to be that. So on the next loop, if we, if we encounter an M, for instance, we're going to be operating on that copy from now on. So let's see what happens. And there we go. Our original uh, object was copied, and then we took that copy and we moved it over by one. So we can keep expanding on this example. So the other cool thing is, if if this loop um, doesn't doesn't recognize a character, it will just skip it, right? It's just going to go i plus one. Oh, it wasn't an m, it wasn't a d, so I'm just going to skip it. So that allows us to put spaces in here to organize this a little bit better. So so make a copy, move that copy over by one and then maybe make another copy and then move that up up the y-axis by one and then I'm just going to copy and paste this and then maybe we'll, we'll make a tower here so it's going to make a copy of the initial move it over by one then make a copy of that move it up by one make a copy of that move it up by one and so forth we hit play and we have like a little tower now Now it would also be kind of nice if we had the ability to repeat. I don't want to have to copy and paste this uh, a million different times. So let's introduce a repeat statement. And a repeat statement is basically saying, we'll, we'll just say repeat everything to the left of our thing. So for instance, um, we're going to introduce the letter R as a repeat statement. And that's going to basically say when it reaches this command, it's going to know to repeat everything to the left of R basically. And, we can we, we, and we're going to make one parameter for that, a number, one to nine. And so basically it's going to say repeat um, everything to the left nine times in this case. And then we can continue on with other statements, but uh, this will be a nice way to, a shorthand way of like making like long structures just by simply um, using a single letter here. And, and the reason why we're going to be using a capital R is for two reasons. We're going to be using lowercase r to do rotate, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, and capital will also make it stick out a little bit better in our string. And because repeats are actually going to be fairly, when we start um, using additional repeats, you can imagine that the way repeat is going to work, if, it, if it's repeat everything to the left, this is going to now repeat everything to the left of this, which means that it's going to do this nine more times. So it's going to be nine times two in this case, or 18 total times this is going to iterate. So we want to just make sure that R sticks out a little bit so we can kind of see those and pull them out or uh, if we need to, if we see it gets kind of slow. And again, because low, R, lowercase r is going to turn into a rotate command that we're going to do later. So that's why uh, capital R was chosen for repeat. OK, so just, just like we did with duplicate, we're going to say if C happens to equal capital R, then uh, we're going to perform a repeat uh, logic. So for this, uh, we're going to basically recurse into this function again. So we're going to take everything to the left of our r, and we're going to basically recall this function run, uh, passing that left part of that string into this code variable. And we're going to loop basically inside here. And then when we come out of the loop, we're going to continue on. So, how, so again, just like we did here, we're going to interpret our first parameter as the number of repeats. So that's going to be num is equal to uh, r plus 1. Again, that's our first parameter of r here. So just like this had three parameters, the m had three parameters. And we had to step into them this way, i plus 1 plus 2 plus 3. r is going to have one parameter. That's going to be the number of times we repeat. So we're going to look at the plus one, and that's going to be a repeat number. Repeat number, and we're going to convert that to a to a number so that we can you can we can then iterate using a, a for loop. And, and the other thing we need to do is we need to grab the left hand side of our of our script up to this point, up to that point of R. So to do that, we're going to say our left code is equal to our code sub starting at the first character, so that's always gonna, it's always going to repeat everything starting from 1 all the way up to R. So it's starting at the first character to wherever I happens to be. Again, that's going to be, in this case, at R, minus 1, because we don't want to include that repeat character. We don't want the R. So it's, this is now going to return this string here is our left code. And we have to, don't forget to iterate I. So I is equal to I plus 1. Again, we need to step over this, this parameter here so that the next parameter is is after the 9 basically so we got to step over this 
And then we can loop over our, uh, we're gonna call this function recursively, um, the total number of times that was passed in, nine times in this case. Then we're gonna use a for statement. So we're gonna say for, in this case I'm gonna use a different letter than i, because we're using i out here. So I'm gonna use p as our iteration value. For p is equal to one, to our repeat num, do, and then we're just gonna call our functions, run. So this is recursively calling this function. We're gonna call it on our object, and we're gonna pass in our, our, um, our code, our left code. So it's gonna repeat um, everything to the left of r nine times in this case, by just recalling this function. And uh, the other thing we're gonna to wanna to do is, we're gonna want uh, this, because we, when we come out of this loop and we start processing additional commands that might be to the right of r, we want those to operate on the object that was last returned by the last run function. Again, because run can duplicate, every time, when we recursively call this run function, it may in, inside there duplicate items. And so we wanna just make sure when we come out of this for loop that we're operating on that last object that maybe this function um, duplicated. And so we're gonna actually modify this, this function to return the last object it happened to duplicate, whatever the object it happened to duplicate, and then we're gonna set it out here equal to that return value. So that when we come out of this kind of recursive loop, OBJ is gonna be equal to whatever it happened to leave off on, which then will allow the, the outer uh, function to continue on using the last object that was duplicated. I hope that makes sense. Uh, we'll, we'll, um, we'll go into this a little bit slower as we, as we try different examples here on the script. Uh, one other small little thing that we want to be aware of is when we call this function recursively, it's going to then go in here and um, basically any variable that's local will be um, won't get won't affect um, the outer call. So notice here, for instance, left code we didn't define this as local, and that's a problem because when we recursively call this function, if it then encounters a recursive function, it's going to then overwrite that left code function such that when it comes out of that function this is gonna be mutated. Um, so long story short, we wanna just make sure that left code is defined locally to ensure that when we call this recursive function, the next time inside there, if it happens to call this um, recursive function again, it doesn't mutate the value such that when we come out of that recursive loop, this isn't been changed. So just, just it's a little confusing to explain, but just make sure we, do, we need to make sure this is local, this, 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 um, this variable here. Because if it's not local, then other people can mutate it lives globally, essentially, and so the state can get changed uh, by other invocations of, of run. Okay, so I think we have everything we need here. So we now have a repeat statement that should allow us to say, in this case, take that original object, make a duplication of it, move it over by one, and then we're going to repeat that nine times um, on that last object. So let's see what happens here. And there we go. We now have... Um, are a simple little statement that's just repeating this initial logic here. So we can easily make a tower here if we say y plus one. We're saying duplicate this object, go up by one, and then repeat that duplication process. Repeat everything to the left nine times. And so that does that, it creates a tower of nine. If we were to put another duplication to the right of that, it's actually gonna then duplicate this twice in this case. It's gonna do everything to the left twice, which then will do nine times Two nine time two nine length towers here, so we're going to actually have a tower of eighteen length now. When we hit play, and there it is. And already, so already with this very simple little system here. For instance, maybe we want to repeat nine times the initial tower, but before we repeat this twice, we want to perform um, another movement here, mx plus one. Let's see what that does. So that creates an interesting stair step pattern because it's saying. Um, Duplicate the first heading nine times, and then move by one, and then again, repeat this, this stuff to the left nine times, move by one, repeat that nine times, and then unfortunately it will again move that last item by one. That's why it's kind of left over at the top, which is a little weird, but. Um, so it's it's a cool way to very quickly kind of get these interesting structures. So maybe we'll, we'll go, uh, before we repeat here, we can actually uh, maybe reset uh, back down to the ground, and before we go to the right here. And so, actually, um, we're gonna have to do an additional one, uh, my minus, my minus one, because it's 10 here. So now we actually have like a wall that we've created. So we keep repeating that, let's say we repeat that nine times, we have like a, a full wall here. Just simply do, uh, doing this. Another simple one is, let's create, a, let's create a box, let's create a square. So that's gonna be duplicate an item, move over by one, then um, duplicate that item, move over it by one, 
Then we're going to duplicate that item. We're going to move it up by one. We're going to duplicate that item. We're going to move that up by one. Then we're going to duplicate that item. We're going to move it uh, left by one. Uh, duplicate that item. We're going to move uh, left by one. And then finally, uh, duplicate that item. We're going to move it uh, down by one. I'm going to do one more time. Duplicate that item and move it down by one. So let's see what that does. We create a little square that way. Because what we did is we essentially moved it over by one, moved it over by one, then moved up, duplication, and we created this interesting little box here. So now if we take this whole system and repeat that um, nine times, or repeat that twice to see what happens. Uh, let's see what happens. Nothing, because it goes back to the original one. So before we repeat, let's uh, let's add uh, another trans uh, transform. We're going to move over by, we're going to duplicate and then move that one over by, um, let's do the four. And now we have these little boxes. Let's repeat that uh, ten times, or nine times. We can't do double digits, we can only do one digit. So if you want to do more than uh, one, we'll have to do another repeat statement. So we have these little boxes here. How about we move it uh, up instead? That's kind of neat. Um, let's let's return on our physics timeline here, and so we now we got this kind of collapsing. Oh, and there's some duplication in there. So now we have this interesting structure that collapses every time from a very simple little script here. Okay, so we've added move, but there's a bunch of other ones that we might want to add here. So we have a simple little transform to move. We have a, a duplication function. We have a repeat function. Let's add a um, let's add rotation. So that's another one that we'll want to do. Um, that's that's always kind of interesting. So for rotation, uh, we'll, we're going to use lowercase c for that. So if c is equal equal to r, then, and just like we did um, with move, we're going to interpret um, rotation is going to be, we're going to get rid of this little box. Actually, I'm going to remark this because I do like that little box. And we're going to create a new script here. That's going to be a rotation. So for now, I'm going to say make a duplication and then rotate by one unit, and I'll explain how we're going to do this, how we're going to interpret this number for rotation. So this is going to be our form for rotation, r plus one, oh, um, r x, sorry, um, r, in this case, we'll say y. So it's going to be rotate, just like move, along the y-axis, uh, one unit in the positive direction. So just like we did for move, I'm going to just copy and paste this, and we're going to convert this to a vector. So our first item is going to be our axis, and then um, we're going to convert that to a vector, and then instead of rotating or in positioning, we're going to be rotating. So I'm going to set set world rotation to get the world rotation. Get the world rotation actually as Euler angles is a full it's a full function plus or v. So the weird thing here is what is this number? How do we interpret this number in terms of rotation? So again, this number we we don't handle multiple uh, parameters like multiple numeric parameters. We're only going to handle one to nine basically, and so we have to basically convert this number from 1 to 9 into a useful rotation value. And so one way to do it is just we could split, um, we can consider 1 to 9 uh, basically 0 to 180. And so if we want to do like a full 360 rotation, we can just do 2 R Y plus 9s. If we do two of those, we'd have 360. So uh, to give us a little bit of resolution for rotation, we're going to basically treat 1 to 9 as 0 to 180. So we're going to just take that number that comes out of this unit and we're going to convert this to a number out here to number. So this number that's 1 to 9, we're going to take 180 and we're going to divide that into 9 units basically. That's going to be our range of our value. And then we're going to multiply that by our unit. And this is going to be our angle. So basically what we're saying is we're going to divide 180, half of, that half of the uh, amount of rotation we want to support in one operation. We're going to divide that into 9 equal chunks. And then depending on the unit we pass in, we're going to get um, some fraction of that equal chunk. So you imagine if we pass in 1, we're going to get you know, 1 ninth of, of 180. But if we, if we pass in 9, we're going to get the full 180, basically. So that's going to be, it's, this 180 is split up into, eight chunk, into 9 chunks. And so now what we're going to do, since we're adding that to the Euler angle, rotation angles, this is just, these, these are in radians. And so we just need to convert this to... Um, we need to convert that angle into our um, into radians because this is going to be 180 and 9. This is all being done in, in degrees. We just need to convert that to radians. So there's a function math.rad. That, that's a uh, Lua function called rad. It just takes a value that's in 
angles, so it's 0, 180, 360, and all variants of that, and converts that to radians, which is just basically 0 is equal to 0, 360 is equal to 2 pi, 180 is equal to pi, and so forth. So it's just a different interpretation of the same numbers. But, but our object, uh, our internally, we want radians, not, not uh, angles, and so we just need to make sure we convert that. So we're, so I think we're all set here. Um, we're going to take our number. We're going to treat that number 1 to 9 as 0 to 180. We're then going to we calculate that, that in angles. We're then converting that angles to radians. And then that's what we're going to be adding to the object's current rotation. So again, it's a destructive. Every single time, it's going to rotate. If we rotate, then the next object will rotate off of that and so forth. And then we, again, we advance our i to skip those next three values. So we're ready to consume the next command that comes after that. OK, so we're going to. So if this works, um, we are going to take that first the item, we're going to duplicate it, and then we're going to actually move it to the right so we can see it. So I'm going to do mx plus 1. And then we're going to rotate that item uh, 1 along the y-axis. So that's like should spin uh, above the y-axis. Let's see what happens. And there we go. Duplication was made, and a rotation happened. So let's repeat that. Repeat that nine times to see what happens. I'm going to go ahead and pause physics again. Going to the terrain spaces timeline, I'm going to set active to false here. So there we go. We've kind of permuted through all the different rotations. So this is this first cube. Um, this first cube was rotated that, and then that was rotated a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, and then it's kind of completing the circle in this case, completing that half circle. So if we do R9 and do another R9, although that's going to repeat it again, um, but we'll start to get interesting patterns here. And so now we have this interesting, this kind of repeating rotational pattern here. Um, Let's add scale. Let's let's uh, actually. I'm going to start to label this. Um, so this is move. This is rotate. Rotate. This is duplicate. Duplicate. This is going to be a repeat. Okay. So we've added uh, move, rotate. Let's add scale um, so that we can start to get some crazy, interesting shapes uh, that derive. So scale. We're going to do in a very similar way to all these other commands. I'm going to clarify this a little bit by putting spaces in here. Get rid of these repeats. OK, so there's our, our duplication function, D. There's our move by one axis, by one unit, or rotate. And now scale will use the same form. We're going to set the letter lowercase s for scale. And then we can choose whatever axis we want, and then the amount we want to scale it uh, uh, on that axis. So we're going to literally copy exactly how we do it with this. So else if that, this is going to be scale. And this is going to, if this is equal to s. We're going to pull out the axis direction of the unit. We don't need to do any conversions. We're already in world space. We're good to go. We're going to convert that number, that unit, to a number there. We'll get a nice vector. And uh, the next thing we need to do is perform the actual scale. Now, we could actually do it to the scale transform. But the problem with doing it to the transform is it won't. physics won't react cor correctly. Physics is doesn't look like scale. Um, so we want to actually affect the object's shape. Um, so we're going to treat scale as a value that's going to actually change the shape of the uh, of the box. So I'm going to show you what I mean here. So um, th this is the transform of the object. But you'll notice that the this object actually doesn't have a scale as part of its transform. It has position and rotation, which is what we're setting up here. Set world position, set world rotation. We're affecting this part of the transform. But there is no scale. And the reason why is that physics doesn't like scale. Um, it wants you, physics wants you to kind of uh, define scale through the underlying shape of the object. And so hence, we, we don't want to set the scale like we do with the other parts. We're going to want to do it by actually setting the scale of the box directly. And so we're going to be setting the dimensions. So our S is going to actually go in and set the dimensions of the box. So let's go and do that. So um, we're going to take our object. We're going to get its mesh model. We're working our way down our, our structure here. So this is our object. We're going to get the mesh model, which is this thing. And then we're going to get the shape, the shape. And then we're going to set the dimensions equal to, and we want to make this, um, again, we want to make this um, saturative. We want this like every single time we either have to choose, add, or subtract. We want to kind of accumulate it because it will allow us to do cool like, you know, um, feedback based effects. If we just set it absolutely, then it's not as, as fun as, as actually making it additive. Um, so then we have to basically say minus one if we want to work it back down to the original size. So this is going to say take the dimensions and add the current dimension and just add that, that vector that we calculated from here. So now we have a scaling function. So back to our command up here, we're going to take this, duplicate it, we're going to move it over by one, we're going to rotate that, that new item, and we're also going to scale it. And then we're going to repeat that again. 
And so it's going to take the new one, repeat, and scale. So that's going to scale along the x-axis by one. Let's see what happens. And there we go. Took it, moved it over, scaled that up, took that one, moved it over, and repeat that. And so let's let's see what happens if we um, if we do more repeats here. Ooh, now we got some interesting shapes here. So let's take that and let's repeat that nine times. You know, we get, start to get these really interesting things here. This is an interesting little pattern here that's caused by that, that structure here. Let's enable our timeline and our space to see what happens. It'll explode and it does something weird. Uh, I'm going to re-deactivate the timeline. Okay, so that's pretty neat. Um, so we're already starting to get some kind of neat, kind of fractally looks here. It looks like a Christmas tree, kind of, sort of. Um, so let's let's add something else here. Let's so we have movement, we have rotation, we have scale. Um, the other one we might want to do is let's add a physics force. So um, we can actually create um, as soon as we hit play, interesting explosions that will emit outwards. And to do the physics explosion, it's identical to everything else to move, rotate, and scale. We're just gonna we're gonna treat another three set of parameters as our impulse in this case. So I'm gonna set i as our impulse. And we're going to say we're going to add an impulse along the y-axis uh, in one unit. So that's just like everything else. So I'm just literally going to copy and paste this stuff. And one nice thing that we can we could eventually do is we could write maybe a little a, a little helper function to kind of do this. That will help condense our code a little bit. But I think for the purposes of this, copying pasting is fine. So when we see the letter i for an impulse, we're going to again look at the axis, the direction, the unit. We're going to increment i so that we can ready to consume the next command, and we're going to convert that to a vector. And we're just going to inject that into our object. So we're going to say object get rigid body. And in this case, we're going to apply a central impulse. This is our physics function to do this central impulse. And we're going to do that using v, that vector that we're going to be passing in. So we're good to go. That is ready to, to inject an impulse along the y-axis. So everything should kind of fly up. I'm going, to, I'm going to reduce this back down to one repeat here. And I'm going to re-enable the timeline and the space. I'm going to set active to true. And now we get this cool kind of upward explosion. And we're going to, I'm going to increase the mass a little bit of this, um, of this object so that this will kind of make the force less, less forceful. So now we get this kind of, this kind of thing. And instead of maybe moving, uh, moving it to the right, I'm going to move it um, when it's upwards instead. We'll get these nice little like rotated towers, which is kind of neat. And it's actually quite stable. This is like a DNA uh, helix here. If we, um, I'm going to go ahead and pause again. I'm going to pause, click on the ground, and hit active to false. I'm just doing this so that things stay in place here. If we were to repeat this nine times, we'll get a nice kind of, um, ooh, that gets bigger. If we don't size it, let's just say we take it and just make this, um, actually, yeah, we'll, we'll want to resize it down. Let's see if we can get that to work. Let's see if this works. But that's going to do it per. See what happens if we do this. Not really. Yeah, we're not quite getting the DNA thing, but we'll, there's another way we're going to be able to do that in a second using a different technique here. Okay, so we now have an impulse function. I'm going to re-enable the timeline of the space. So we have that cool kind of vertical explosion now, which is neat. How about we do an impulse along the X uh, instead of the Y. Instead of upwards, we go sideways. Now it falls over every time we play, which is pretty neat. Let's not scale them and see what happens. Uh, which is just like a tower that falls over immediately, which is kind of weird. Um, I do like scale. I think the scale looks really cool. Maybe we'll scale them. Let's do more rotation in this case. So now they're, they're, it's a different rotative structure. So we have duplication. We have uh, movement, rotation, scale. We have a physics impulse. Another one might be color. We might want to affect the color of this object using our little parameters. So let's add color. So we're going to do this very similarly. In a, so for color, I think what we're, we'll do is we'll say C for color. That's our color command. And then we're going to say, I think, R, G, or B. R, G, B, or alpha to set the, the various components. So our, our color structure will be, instead of X, Y, Z, it's going to be uh, A or you know R plus 1. So it's going to be like, make it a little bit redder, uh, or make it a lot more redder, or you know green, and so forth. So this is going to be the, the, the format of our, of our color command. So we're going to, like all these other ones, we're going to say if we're dealing with the letter C, uh, we're going to interpret the next three things as, as a color. So the first thing is not going to be a, a channel. Uh, it's not going to be an axis. It's going to be a channel. So it's going to be RGBA, RGB or A. 
and then uh, direction that's still going to be plus or minus. We're either going to make it brighter or, or darker. And the unit is again going to be how much we're going to unit. So that's the same. So, but we're not going to, we need a different function here because this, this expects x, y, or z as our first parameter. But we're going to be passing in RGB uh, as, our, our, as our channel value. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new helper function called to color. So we're going to return our color, color. And then we're going to be setting the color from that. So let's go write that little helper function. So just like we have two vector here, I'm just going to copy this. And this is going to be to color. And this is going to take in a channel, that channel variable, channel, and everything else is the same. So instead of this, we're going to, so colors internally are actually vector fours. Um, and so we basically now want to, um, so vector fours have x, y, z, or w. So we need to remap RGBA to x, y, z, w. And to do that, I'm just going to create a little remapping table here, and, and I'll explain this in a second. So we're going to say color channels to axes. It's just a simple little table here. And in this table, I'm going to set basically every time we see R, it's going to equal to X. And I'll explain this in a second. That means R, G, B, A, A, B, R, or A, B, A, G. So what we're going to do is, since channel is going to be R, G, B, A, we're going to index using this, this variable here into this color channel here. Oops, sorry. This should be X, Y, Z, Gs. Yikes. X, Y, Z, W. So we're going to index, this channel is going to be our index into our table here, so it's going to be R, G, B, R, A, and then that's going to return either X, Y, Z, or W, which we're then going to index into our vector 4, because that's what it expects as a table of X, Y, Z, and W, to set that parameter to uh, whatever unit we're passing in here. So instead of uh, passing in the channel directly like this, since we don't have an R, G, B, A in, in the vector 4 channel, we're just going to use this remapping uh, table. So that's just basically converting R to X, G to Y, B to Z, and so forth. Because then vector fours have those inside them, and then we can directly set that unit number and that element inside our vector four. And again, we're going to flip the, the sign and then return that, that value. So now to color, we'll return our vector four. And then we're just going to set our color, our object's color, equal to our object's color plus that. Plus, uh, plus that, that color that came out of that. And then we're going to, again, you know, skip the next three parameters that we've consumed here using that. One other little thing that we're going to have to do, or actually, no, we're, we're good to go. Okay, so let's see what happens um, if we adjust the color now. So we're saying make it a little bit redder, um, every element, and see what happens. There we go. So now our falling tower gets redder as we get further out. It's, we have that kind of cool gradient. Um, the only issue here that I don't uh, that we is our units is the other thing we want to consider. So one in this case is going to equal to basically a vector four. Let's let's go back to the color here to see what what I mean here. For instance, that command that we did there will return in this case vector four one zero zero zero. So we're going to be adding that to our existing color. The problem with that is that um, a one is a basically a fully saturated uh, vector. It's going to be a fully saturated color. That's equivalent to RGBA two fifty five zero zero zero. So that that is doesn't give us a lot of control, right? We either can either if we add a one, we're essentially making it completely red. So what we want to do is we want to just we want to take that unit value and give it a little bit more range, um, so that we can if we were to, if we were to say like R if we were to say 1, for instance, maybe that's equivalent in R in 255 to like 20. And if we were to say R2, that's equal to 40 or whatever. So again, we're going to take our unit, our unit value here, and we're going to just take that and divide it by some, some number. I'm going to just say 90. So that whatever we pass in is actually a fraction of, of 90, basically. So you have to you would have to do R plus, you know, let's say you want to increase the red value. You'd have to call that multiple times to make it redder and redder. But we're not like fully saturating it right away, basically. So this will produce a much smaller incrementing value. That we then gives us a little bit more control. Let's see what happens now. So you'll see that now it takes a lot more. Um, we're going to have to type in R, a larger number for R basically up here to, uh, to make it get redder. So we have a bit more control over that gradient now. And if we want to make it really red, we'll just have to repeat this command a few times in here. And now it'll get much redder like we did before. So
so I think one other so the, the last big thing we really want to do is so this is neat this, so this produces these cool structures these interesting structures I'm going to go ahead and pause again the timeline the space so it just kind of stays in midair so this produces these really neat structures but what would be really neat um, and this is where we get this kind of recursive idea is if we can take this um, what if this returned this structure? You know, right now this is just kind of adding all these objects in the space and kind of leaving them there. But we want to be able to run on, on we want to be able to call run again on this thing, for instance. Like everything that is produced, let's say run returns this object here, return this entire object. Then we can call run again with a new command on this entire object. And that's where we get that really cool recursive kind of um, uh, capability. And so to do that, we're going to be modifying our, our little script here so that we get, so that ultimately run returns a node that we can then call run on and then call a new command on that. So to do this, I'm just going to introduce a node in our space. I'm gonna to go to entities, uh, node. And this, this, this can be placed anywhere. We're gonna be making copies of this. And basically, as we add objects, we're gonna add them to a copy of this node. And then this ultimately is what's gonna be returned by our run function, this node here. That will contain as all of its children will be the structure that's produced by our recursion by our command, and then we can then, by taking this object and running run on it, uh, the node that's returned by it, we'll be able to then apply commands on that. So to do this, we're gonna have to kind of modify our run function a little bit. So I'm gonna introduce a new run function. This is gonna be like our root run function, script run. And it's gonna, again, take in our object, our code. And I'm going to uh, rename this run function to underscore run. This is gonna be like an internal run function that we're going to be calling internally inside this function. So run is still going to be called just like we do here in this exact form here. But we're then, by, by, by proxying it like this, by creating an internal run function, we can now kind of create a global set of operations here. And the global set of operations we're going to want to do is we're going to make a copy of that node that we just brought into the space. We're going to clone this as, a, in this case, we can do a shared copy. We're going to, we're going to return that in, in lowercase node. We're going to position this node uh, wherever our object is. So it's going to be positioned where exactly where that box happens to be. Because then we're going to make the box a child of it. And so we want to just make sure it starts in the same location as our original object that we're passing in. I'm going to set its world position to, the, uh, to our object. Get world position. We're then going to, we're going to set the parent object. Um, we're going to basically child our object, our box in this case, to this node so that it's, it's inside that node. And then all objects that are gonna be created are gonna be also added to that node. And then we're gonna essentially return that node uh, as, as, as this function. So it's gonna return that object, a node that contained all the stuff that were created by this run function. And then here we're gonna actually call that internal run function um, using the code. And we're actually gonna pass in that node. Uh, so we're gonna add an additional parameter here. This is our um, this is our result node. This is like the thing that's going to eventually get returned by this by this uh, run function. Okay, so this is going to create a copy of that. It's going to parent our object to that node. We're then going to call run. Run is going to then go through all of its commands. Anytime it makes duplications, we're going to have it add them to this node that we're producing here. So that they're all kind of contained inside this node, all the objects that are produced by this script. So we just need to modify um, our, a couple of things we need to modify. We need to modify our cloning function here. So the resultant object that's returned, we've got to make sure we set its parent node to this. It, actually, if I think about it, it should already have that as its parent node, but we'll just, as a sanity check, we'll just do that here. We'll test to see that. It should already actually have that as its parent node, but we'll just do it explicitly here. And then we also have to just update our repeat function. We're now going to be calling the internal run function because we don't want the recursive function to create new nodes each time. We just want the recursive function to kind of add them to that same node. So we need to call that internal run function and we're going to be passing in that, that parameter it needs here. And again, that's going to return that. I think everything is good to go. So basically what's going to happen is now the re this run function is going to return a node that it's, that's gonna contain all of our structure that's gonna be produced by this, and then we're gonna run again uh, a function on that, uh, a run on that. So let's see what happens when we hit play. Okay, so let's go ahead and grab this node, and we'll see that they're all inside that, they're all inside that node now. So now what we can do is we can take that node that's returned by that run function and operate instead on that node. 
So now we're going to take that. And now what do we want to do? Well, let's let's take that thing. Let's make a duplicate of that. And then that's maybe move that over um, by 10 units or by nine units. And then that's repeat that. Uh, actually, let's rotate it. Let's that's uh, let's do a rotation along the y or on the let's do around the z axis by one unit. And let's repeat that twice. So it's going to take that original object we create from that original thing. It's going to make a duplicate of that two times, and then rotating each duplicate. And so there we go. Now we have this crazy structure. Now we knew we know from before that one unit represents uh, uh, 180 divided by nine. Um, so if we repeat that nine times, we're going to get a half circle here. It's going to get a little expensive because we're going to be doing a lot of objects here. So I'm going to reduce this just a little bit so it just doesn't get too frozen here. Okay, let's go back to this. Okay. I'm going to raise this off the ground so you can see that again we're, uh, let's just take a look at the original object that's produced here before it gets copied that original object that's created is that little like spire thing just a, a, a smaller version of what we had originally uh, repeated that um, and then we're going to take that whole structure that's returned by this function here we're going to make the copy of it we're going to rotate it um, uh, 180 over 9 and we're going to do that nine times so that's going to create a half circle and if so, if we take that whole system and repeat that one time, we're going to get a full circle. And there we go. We have this cool full circle-y thing. So let's, um, I'm going to uh, re-enable physics here. And so we've got this like cool, every time we hit play, it does this neat kind of circle-y thing here. I'm going to add an impulse, uh, I, along the Z axis, Z plus one, and it's going to come flying out at us. No, oh, not quite. Impulse Z. Let's try a little stronger here. There we go. Now it goes away from us. Let's go minus three here. And there we get, get this interesting kind of explosion-y thing. So that's pretty neat. Um, another uh, fun thing that we can do here is um, right now we're, we're calling this, every single time we hit play, it calls this on a knit basically. But let's actually move this into the code for the box. So whenever we click it, it does it on itself. So I'm going to just take this code here. I'm going to remark this so it doesn't happen on, on init anymore. So now we hit play, nothing happens. I'm going to go into this box here, and I'm going to add an attribute uh, on interactable. That's going to allow us to implement a press event. So whenever we click it, we're going to call this script here. So on press. So on press, uh, we're going to we're going to bring in our fractal processor. This is that thing that has all that code that we wrote. I'm going to drag and drop that into here because that's where we're going to call run on. So we're going to call run on that instead of self. Instead of passing the box entity, we're going to call it on ourself here. And we're going to run this command on ourself here. So let's see what happens when we click it now. Every time we click it, we get that. Now, what, watch what happens when I click this. It explodes out to that. I click this, it explodes out to that. Oh, it's getting kind of expensive. So let's, add, let's, let's modify it just slightly so it's not super expensive. I'm just going to get rid of... Actually, let's not do this, this part here yet. Let's just do that here. Every time we click this thing, we get this little spire that pops out of it. Click that, creates that spire. You get these kind of interesting, crazy clicking things here. Maybe we'll get rid of, um, maybe we won't add that impulse here so it just stays in place here. Which is pretty, pretty neat. Um, so the other thing we could do is, for instance, let's just try a simple statement here. Let's just do a bunch of Ds. Bunch of D's ends up being a bunch of ex just a, a big group of boxes in place. Let's just do a bunch of D's. Let's repeat that twice, and let's add uh, four upward um, upward uh, impulses. So now every single time we click this thing, get this like not strong enough. So I'm going to add more more impulse strength. I get this vertical explosions here every time we click this, which is kind of neat. Let's take that and maybe change the color of the blue channel, make that turn blue every time. Now you can see they're getting bluer as I click them. Bluer and bluer and bluer. Just kind of neat. Um, I have like this like interesting pattern of, of colors. So, um, so the neat thing about this is that we've now kind of condensed this down to a simple script. And so, you know, other things we could consider doing with this um, is, for instance, we could and, and maybe we'll do this in a future lesson. We could have a Twitter feed listening. Uh, we could have Symmetry listening on a Twitter feed, and you could tweet at a live uh, show that's being rendered out um, these commands, and then they can manifest. 
that could be a kind of fun thing to try. And you can kind of, other things to try on your own is try adding other commands. Instead of maybe move, rotate, scale, uh, you could add a command to maybe swap axes, you know, swap the X and Z axis. So you could add a command to maybe uh, create a little animation. Um, there's all sorts of possible commands. One other thing actually that we'll do actually, because this, this tends to produce more interesting results here, I'm going to uh, re-enable this code here in the fractal processor to operate on this box so we don't have to click it. Um, one other thing that we might want to do that, that lends itself to slightly nicer recursions is I'm going to reduce this command down to just again a simple duplication and move it over by one unit. So we're back down to this simple case here. Oops, sorry, duplication and then move it along the x by one. So we're back to the simple case here. One other thing that we might want to do is for our rotation command, it might be nice if if we are applied a rotation, if our movement would be along the axis of the rotation. So right now, if we rotate this, for instance, if I take this object, I make a duplication of it, and then I, I rotate it uh, along the y-axis by one unit, and then I move, we saw this before, what happens. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna make it a rotation, and I'm gonna make a duplication of that and move that. You'll see what's happening is that even though um, the objects are rotating, they're always along an axis. They're always fixed along that line. So if I if I repeat this four times or three times here, capital R, you'll see that the rotations, I'm going to pause again, physics time here. You'll see that it's always along this line here. But it might be nice if our movement command was changed so that when it's rotated, the, the, the next object is actually moved along the new axis of rotation. That allows us to build circular shapes, things like that, really easily. So to do this, I'm just going to go and modify our move command here so that we don't move along a fixed axis here, namely the axis that's returned by this vector, this two vector function. It's always going to be axis aligned basically. We want to basically choose an axis that correlates to the rotation of the object. And so to do this, I'm just going to remark this vector here and we're basically going to look at the axis in particular. So we're going to treat um, the x axis. And if it's in the x axis, our vector is going to equal to our objects get world right direction. So whatever it happens to be. So when we apply rotation, this will kind of perpendicularly change with respect to whatever its three axes are, basically. So every object has three axes. Uh, one that faces in the forward direction, referred to as the look at direction. One that faces up, referred to the up direction. And one that faces right, referred to the right direction. As we rotate, these proportionally you know, maintain that these, these are normals that are returned by, by these functions. Get world right direction returns a normal that's going to face the right facing direction of the object, given its rotation. So basically, every time we see x, we're going to use that as a vector. Anytime we see um, y, we're going to use the up direction. So we're going to use the up direction world, up direction. And anytime we see z, we're going to use the world look at direction. And then we're, that, that's again a unit vector. So we're going to take that unit vector, and we're going to scale it by our um, units or whatever our unit happens to be, so it'll get further along that axis. So v is equal to v times unit, which we have to convert to a number. We've got to make sure we convert that to a number here, to number, because normally we're doing that when we pass it into that two vector function. And lastly, we're going to look at the direction. So if our direction is equal, equal to uh, minus, then we'll invert the, the sign. v is equal to v times negative 1. So all we're really doing is instead of uh, instead of always fixing the axes for movement, we're actually aligning now uh, the axes with respect to the object's orientation where it happens to be. So let's see what happens now. Um, we're making uh, we're taking we're making a copy. We're moving that over by one. We're then rotating that copy. Then we're duplicating that, and then we're going to be moving that. But now you'll see that it will be aligned to that new uh, orientation. So we're actually now, when we move, we're, we're moving along the axis of the rotation of the object. So again, to get circles here, we're actually going to, um, again, if we repeat this, since we're doing one rotation nine times, we're going to get a half circle. And if we repeat this um, twice, we're going to get a full circle here. And so if we take that result, let's say, and we um, take the node that's re re returned by this, and if we were to take that and rotate that along the z-axis, we duplicate that and we rotate around the z-axis by 
by by nine units, let's say. We get that. Oh. Mm. Duplicate and rotate. Oh, sorry, let's do about four. So we get that kind of interesting structure here. So let's say we were to repeat that twice, let's see what happens. So we kind of get these interesting kind of ringy structures. Um, so it's a lot more, by going about the axis, we can get a lot more kind of interesting uh, recursion, recursive results along that movement. Um, okay. So I think that wraps uh, about wraps this example up. I'm gonna set that to true, and we got these kind of interesting. Yeah, so that, that was one thing I was curious on here. I was looking at this and I was saying, why is it? Why are these double? Uh, it looks like the scale they're doubly scaled. That's because the, there's a movement. I guess we have to look at our command here, but there must be a movement. We're duplicating, moving, and then rotating, and then duplicating that, and then moving. And so there's like a duplication that happens along that 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 axis, the movement. So it's like movement. Rotating duplicates, so there's like a that's why it's like it's duplicating the items here. So we get rid of this here. Now we have the single single items, which is kind of neat. So go nuts. Uh, this this is a fun one. Uh, I, I I personally find this kind of an interesting concept. And then if we click on these, we're still we still have that logic there. You can um, again by condensing everything down to a string, we have this kind of nifty way of defining kind of a recursive uh, system to develop complex fractals and all sorts of fun stuff. And so all you have to do is just keep messing around with it um, and you can come up with all sorts of crazy shapes and and uh, concepts um, so I hope this was interesting um, uh, if you have any questions let us know